I think it's uh, perhaps ironic that uh, the speaker in this room before me was uh, Judge Napolitano. Uh, Judge Napolitano has a very dramatic speaking style, and I, <laughs> I'm very much a monotone delivery, so I'm afraid in this lecture uh, I won't be telling you how some of you will die in the public <laughs> square. I hope I'm not one of them. <laughs> um, those of you who were, had the misfortune to uh, attend my praxeology lecture on Monday <laughs> will remember I was rather rushed for time at the end. I didn't explain fully all the points that I wanted to make about the a priori and similar mysteries. And I'll, what I want to do in this lecture is go into somewhat more detail about that, um, including material from rather... Is this on? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, I was wanting to say, the old one, if you can't hear me, uh, please put up your hand. Anyone who puts up his hand is lying. <laughs> uh, okay, so I want to go into more detail on the mysteries of the a priori, and also, though, to have some material contrasting uh, history with the praxeology, what are the uh, distinct disciplines, and I'll continue this in... Uh, a discussion of history in my last lecture for today, which is this afternoon on theory and history. At least they were kind enough when they gave me three lectures in a row not to schedule the third one immediately after the preceding two. Uh, now, Mises makes a contrast between theory and in history, praxeology in history. Praxeology is a general science of human action. You remember, in praxeology, we're trying to explain not particular action, but general a general feature that general features that all actions possess. For example, if we say action uses means to achieve an end. This is true of all actions, or uh, an actor will always choose his most highly valued preference. This is something that applies universally. It's true of all <coughs> actions. Now, it doesn't tell us anything about particular actions, say, we were trying to say, why am I giving this lecture? Why are you attending this lecture? That would be, those would be examples of particular actions that are not covered by praxeology. So Mises says, well, because in history we're dealing with these particular actions, there aren't laws of them. It isn't that they're in praxeology, we have laws of human action, laws that apply to every action. But history is concerned with particular events, so we don't have laws. Now, you might raise an objection here, which is that if Mises, is the way Mises characterized praxeology, that it's one of a uh, science of general science of action dealing with general features of, of all actions, then obviously there can't be praxeological laws dealing with particular events because particular events are not, it's, a, it's not a general feature of all action, fortunately, that I'm giving a lecture, it's a particular event. But even if there can't be praxeological laws, <coughs> Of particular events, that isn't the only type of law that there is, aren't there? Scientific laws, which in Mises' view, and here he was quite 
against the views of Karl Popper. Mises thought that scientific laws are based on induction. Let's say the scientist will study particular events that happen and he'll formulate theories on that basis that are then tested out. So why couldn't we have historical laws, laws about particular events that were not praxeological but were inductive? But Mises said, no, no, we can't do that. Uh, because scientists can perform experiments. They can have controlled experiments in which they just change one variable. You can, say, it, uh, mix certain chemicals and say what happens if you increase one of the chemicals by a certain amount, keeping everything else the same. You can't do that with people. You don't have controlled experiments. So Mises said, you don't, can't have laws about particular events. Now, as I said, praxeology is a formal science. And by formal, I mean it deals with the general features of any action not with particular concrete events. I've already said that about 10 times, but that isn't going to stop me from saying it again. <laughs> uh, OK, so question obviously rises, how is it that we're able to come up with these general laws that apply to any action? Mises had a distinctive answer to this, which isn't the same as the one Rothbard had. Uh, Mises said, if we, in order to understand uh, human behavior, okay, we see people walking around, moving their bodies in various ways, doing things, we have to employ certain categories. We have to have certain concepts or ideas that we use in order to understand human behavior. If we didn't have these concepts or ideas, we wouldn't be able to understand what's going on. Say we would just see bodies moving and all sorts of, we wouldn't just say in the way we might see physical particles moving, we wouldn't understand what people are doing. In order to grasp what people are doing, we have to have certain concept, particularly the concept of action. And Mises called this an a priori concept. And by that he meant a, a priori concept is one that you have to have in order to understand experience or a certain range of experience. So unless we have the, this concept of action, we won't be able to understand what's going on. Say, if uh, we'll just see, we would just see various physical motions, but we wouldn't grasp what was going on without this a priori concept. So, one mistake a lot of people make is they confuse. A pri an a priori concept, as Mises used the term, with an innate concept, something like something that's built into us by evolution. Some people think the brain is hardwired to think in certain ways. So they think, when they hear reference to a priori concept, they think that what Mises is claiming is that we're kind of built to view things in a certain way, that this is something that uh, evolution or whatever has brought us about has gotten into us. We have to think in this way because this is the way our brain is structured. Uh, but that is a different question. The question how we arrive, how the, the genetic question, how we arrive at uh, our way of thinking, how 
the, what gave rise to is a different question from that of the a priori. Uh, an a priori concept is one, as I say, that you need to understand a certain range of experience. An a priori proposition, which is different, you know, a, a, priori, a proposition is different from a concept. A concept is an idea in your mind, not necessarily an idea about your mind, but an idea that you have. A, a proposition is a judgment. It's saying that something is the case or isn't the case. So an a priori judgment would be one that you can immediately see to be true by thinking about it. And as I suggested in my lecture Monday, it's one that doesn't need testing to establish. Once you grasp it's true, that's it. So see, a priori concept, you see, the different a priori concept is one you need to have in order to grasp a certain range of experience. This is not something that is something that's just built innate or built into your brain. We're not addressing the question how you got the concept, it's what use the concept is. If you have it, and you can see, supposing we made this mistake, supposing we start talking about innate ideas, things that are ideas that are simply built into us, then we would have the question, well, how do we know those ideas are, will lead us to truth? Maybe we've been hardwired to arrive at falsehoods. But that isn't what's at issue with either a priori concepts or a priori truth. To the contrary, the notion here is an a priori concept. Again, you need the concept in order to understand a certain range of experience a priori proposition or judgment is one you immediately grasp to be true. So it has nothing to do with the genetic basis by which you have these concepts or judgments. Now, there's one passage, if you, for those of you who've read Mises' Epistemological Problems of Economics, uh, that's a if you're interested in the uh, question of methodology, that's a very good book to read. Uh, I especially like the index to the English translation of that book because I did it. Uh, <laughs> so now there's a passage that might give a, a misleading impression of Mises' position. Uh, he says here, Reason, history, and logic are historical phenomena. Human logic is a historical phase between pre-human non-logic on the one hand and superhuman logic on the other. Uh, so this might lead the unwary reader to think, oh, Mises is some kind of think there's some kind of evolution of thought. At one time people were pre-logical, but then they're going to be super logical in the future, and we're in this intermediate stage. But this, um, one reason I brought this up, this is a sometimes a, somewhat of an obstacle in reading Mises. He very often will elaborate at quite some length the position he's opposing. So this is not what Mises' own position, but the position Mises is opposing. This is one thing you need to bear in mind when you're reading Mises, even if you're not interested in these philosophical questions at all, although that's something that's very difficult to imagine that anyone could not be interested <laughs> in these topics. Whenever you read Mises, you have to be very careful. Make sure when you attribute something to him, it's something, a position he's defending. He's not setting for, not something where he's setting forward some position he's going to oppose. Uh, there are people who made that mistake uh, who might surprise you, but I'm not going to, I won't name names. Uh, so, as I say, this is not 
the position, this position, there's been an evolution of thought is not one that Mises is defending, it's one that he's opposing. Now, he's reluctant to say that make claims about the nature of the world. He just said people can't help thinking in this way, in a way, say, uh, with the concept of action. We can't make sense of human behavior without this concept. He's reluctant to make absolute claims about reality. He just says, well, we can't know anything about other logics, if there are any, even though he doesn't believe there are. But his basic point is that we need certain concepts in order to understand a certain range of experience, and that makes them a priori concepts. Uh, now, here in this, I'll be going over what I said bef before. Mises talks about a priori concepts. The concept of action is one we need to make sense of human behavior. But he's very often concerned with a priori propositions. The difference, again, between a concept and proposition is a concept is an idea and a proposition is an assertion. It's a judgment. If I say uh, 2 plus 2 equals 4, that's a judgment. So I didn't take note, in an earlier slide, I didn't take note of this because I was talking about a priori concepts. I gave 2 plus 2 equals 4, that's an a priori judgment. So you understand then the difference between a priori concept and a priori judgment. Now, as I say, an a priori proposition is one that you can know without confirming it empirically. If I say 2 plus 2 equals 4, I don't have to keep counting sets of objects. You have 2 here, 2 there. Okay, you add them up, they equal 4. I don't have to keep repeating that. I grasp immediately that they're 2 plus 2 equals 4. I grasp that the judgment is true. Incidentally, uh, reminds me I, the story of uh, uh, the, you know, the easy way to estimate the number of people in a crowd is uh, you count the legs and divide by four. Prolonged laughter, please. Uh, okay, so as I say, uh, an a priori proposition is one that you can know without confirming it empirically, but somebody could come to know a, a judgment, a proposition that's a priori true without grasping it's an a priori truth. For example, supposing there is a math theorem that you read about in a book and you believe that it's true and it is true just because it's in this textbook and that's you have good reason to think that's a reliable book. So you know that the, the proposition is true, but you wouldn't have grasped it just by thinking about it. You would have believed it because it's in the book. So a priori proposition is one that you can know just by thinking about it. Now, uh, one point I should mention here, I don't think I have it on the slides, is, is one that people miss very often, is an a priori proposition, let's say one where you're claiming to, that you can grasp it's true just by thinking about it, doesn't have to consist of a priori concepts. Remember, a priori concept is one of these that you need to make sense of a range of experience. Uh, for example, suppose I say, some people have given this, and I think it's a good, make good case for you, that this is an a priori proposition. Nothing can be red and green all over at the same time. The claim would be, if you think about that, you'll grasp that that's true. Okay, that's, if this claim's right, that's an a priori truth, but it's not, it doesn't consist entirely of a priori 
concepts, red and green aren't a priori concepts. They're presumably we get these from the empirical world. So a priori proposition doesn't have to consist of a priori concepts. And this is, I mention this because some people say, oh, well, look, you know, a priori, uh, if you have a priori, suppose a priori truths are just consists of ideas people have that are jo uh, joined together in proposition. So how do we know they apply to reality? Don't we still have to have empirical tests? Well, we can start off with, op we can have a priori propositions that make direct reference to reality, such as human beings <coughs> act, act uh, actions are there in the world. So it's not a question just about talking about ideas in our mind. There are actions. So again, remember, a priori proposition doesn't have to consist of a priori concepts, although it can. Uh, so, good. So I was, shows how I'm quite senile. I said I didn't know I, whether this was on one of the slides, and this is the slide where I explain that. Uh, now, uh, I now remember in my praxeology lecture, I was su suggested that the, there was a logical positivist criticism of the notion of a priori knowledge. And the logical positivists said something like this, uh, all true propositions are either what they called analytic or synthetic. A synthetic proposition is one that's true about the world. For example, I'm giving a lecture is a synthetic proposition. It's a truth about the world. An analytic proposition is what they called a truth of meaning. And that this would be, suppose I say, uh, all bachelors are male. That's true just because of the way the word bachelor is defined, all bachelors are male. It isn't a discovery we make about ba bachelors. They all turn out to be men. That's part of the definition. So the logical positivists said all truths are either analytic or synthetic, and the only truths that tell us something about the, the, wor the, the analytic truths don't tell us anything about the world. So all a priori truths, all truths that we can realize are true just by thinking about them, are analytic. They don't tell us anything about the world. Uh, in my lecture on Monday, I suggested this criticism doesn't work because we really can't sharply separate analytic and synthetic truths. There aren't most terms in language don't have clear definitions. So we can't really separate out some special realm of true, true by meaning. There aren't such things. It's really all truths are synthetic. So if you take that view, then it becomes much easier to defend a priori truths because then you could say, well, why can't there be truths about the world just that you realize are true that don't need further testing? Uh, aren't there certain truths that are obviously true, like human beings act? But what I want to do now is say, could we, suppose we accepted this distinction, which I don't think we should, between the analytic and the synthetic truth, where we say they're analytic, there are certain propositions that are just true by meaning, and others that are made true by what happens in the world. Suppose we accepted that, could we still make sense of the praxeology? Could we still make sense of 
explain means is one say that we can arrive at, at real knowledge through praxeology. I should say, uh, just by way of digression, the logical positivists were an interesting group of people. They were a group centered at the University of Vienna in the 1920s and 30s by uh, the, the, uh, the head of the group was uh, Moritz Schlick, who was a professor of philosophy at University of Vienna. And uh, there were a number of very eminent philosophers who were in that group, such as uh, uh, Rudolf Carnap and uh, the mathematician uh, uh, Hans Hahn attended. There were others uh, who Wittgenstein had some connection with them, although he was definitely not a logical positivist. They were interested in him. And I, I should say, uh, the Schlick illustrates the dangers of an academic career. Uh, it, at the University of Vienna, uh, one of his doctoral students uh, had uh, wasn't very happy about something Schlick had done. It's uncertain what it what the problem was. Some people say it was because Schlick had failed him in an exam, or other people think that uh, Sch uh, Schlick thought that the student thought Schlick was trying to get involved with his girlfriend. But in any event, he came to Schlick's office and shot him dead. So this is something you have, that would be a good reason to avoid being a logical positivist, <laughs> I think. Uh, but what the, uh, again, uh, the logical, so what we're trying to do is come up with the, some defense against the logical positivist attack on uh, the uh, way Mises proceeds in praxeology. Uh, many people find the idea of a priori knowledge very odd. I'll say, well, how can we find out anything about the world just by thinking about it? Say, if I wanted to know how many people are in this room, I'd have to count them. I couldn't say, well, I thought about the matter and there have to be uh, 23 people here. I have an argument that shows there must be 23 people here. That wouldn't make much sense. So one way of responding to that, again, it's not the way I recommend, but it's just what we're doing now is saying, what happens if we take this, this view of the logical positivist where we divide truth into analytic and synthetic seriously? What I'm, we could say analytic propositions, or we remember the, the logical positivists say, all a priori truths are analytic. So we could say, uh, analytic propositions don't give us new knowledge. They're just ways of say, uh, saying the same thing. They're just tautologies, say, just a way of saying the same thing. So they're not really telling us anything new. And then there's a contrasting pro uh, view that all, there are some a priori truths are synthetic that they do give us knowledge of the world. Now, I advanced in the, uh, my lecture on Monday the view, well, really all propositions are synthetic. There aren't any special truths of meaning or that can be separated out. But there are some people who think there are analytic pr uh, propositions that don't give us new knowledge, but there are also a priori truths that are synthetic and do give us new knowledge that are not tautology. Now, one thing I find very interesting, uh, people often assume that Mises was a defender of the synthetic a priori. And if you take my view, he should have been a defender of the synthetic a priori because I don't think there are any analytic propositions, at least not any interesting ones. But Mises never says that in human action. Uh, he says that, he does not say that the 
propositions of economics or synthetic a priori true. He says they're a priori true. And he says, in fact, in some places that the propositions of economics are tautologies. Remember, tautology is a statement that isn't saying anything new. Uh, Wittgenstein gives an example of a tautology. Suppose someone asks you what the weather is, and you say, well, it's either raining or not raining. That's a tautology. It's just an example it's of a particular logical law. Uh, everything is either A or not A. Uh, but it isn't giving you any information about the world. You don't really know what the weather is if you know it's either raining or not raining. So uh, some people would say, well, if uh, praxeology consists of the so-called a priori truths, but they're all tautologies, then they're not, it isn't giving you any, new, any useful information. Again, I don't think this is a view you should adopt, but in some places Mises does seem to adopt this, or does adopt this, so he says, praxeology consists of tautology, so does that, does that entail that praxeology isn't useful? It, I don't, and again, Mises deals with the point, this isn't correct. There are tautologies that are, do give you new knowledge. For example, according to the logical positivist, mathematics consists of tautologies, but we certainly learn something when we prove some new mathematical theorem. And I recommend here, there's a very good article by uh, Leland Yeager, uh, Tautologies in Economics and Natural Sciences. So he has a, a very good discussion of this notion of the useful tautology. Now, in one of his last books, uh, it's called The Ultimate Foundation of Economic Science, a very short book, Mises seems somewhat sympathetic to the synthetic a priori. Remember, synthetic a priori is a view. We can have a priori truths, ones that are, we know to be true just by thinking about them, but they do give us knowledge of the world. So Mises, in this book, doesn't, again, doesn't commit himself to say praxeology consists of synthetic a priori truths, but he, he does raise, I think it's a very interesting argument, he says, suppose you say, there aren't any synthetic a priori truths. Uh, Paul Samuelson is one who said that. He said uh, there, there are no uh, empirical a priori truths. That means every a priori truth doesn't tell you, no a priori truth tells you anything about the world. So Mises says, well, suppose you say there are no synthetic a priori truths. Well, how do you know that? That appears to be something your people are supposed to just think about and realize it's true. So it's, if it's true, it's an a priori truth. But it, if it were true, it would be a truth about the world. So we would have the synthetic a priori truth. There are no synthetic a priori truths. That appears to be somewhat problematic, to say the least. Uh, so again, though, I think that's an interesting argument. Mises just mentions it in passing. Now, one other confusion that you have to avoid I, about uh, synthetic a priori truth is that a synthetic a priori truth doesn't have to be necessary. The necessary truth is one that couldn't be otherwise, as they say in the logical jargon. It's true in all possible worlds. It couldn't be false. It, for, it, we could have a priori truths that are not necessary. For example, I now exist if I say it is a priori. I grasp this is true just by thinking about it, but it's not necessary. There are 
I might not exist. It's not a necessary truth. So you have to be very careful to distinguish a priori. It's a category of how we know things, know them by thinking about them, that they don't require testing. And necessary truths, necessary truth is we talk about what ontology, metaphysics, what must or be the case, a contingent truth is one that is true but might not be. That's not epistemology. In, in uh, we talk about a priori, we're concerned with epistemology. Uh, now, uh, I now want to deal with another part which is very important. I dealt with this a little bit in my first lecture on praxeology. It comes in both in praxeology and in history, that this principle applies to both, and that's methodological individualism. Uh, and this is the, view, the principle that only individuals act. The actions of collectives like nations or classes have to be cashed out in terms of the actions of individuals. It isn't the view that nations, classes, and collective entities don't exist. It's the view that only individuals act. Now, Mises makes, I think, a very important point, that uh, one that is often missed. In, uh, and this quotation is from Epistemological Problem. He's not claiming that individuals come before groups, exist in time before groups that say, we start off in a state of nature with separate individuals and these get together and form collectives. Somebody could say, look, as far back as we know, human beings have always existed in tribes or groups. That isn't the claim. It isn't a claim about temporal priority. It's rather a claim about that only individuals act. So he isn't saying, say, that a species, a race, or family has to come into existence after the, the people who are in it. Now, in this, I'll be dealing with this later in my last lecture uh, this afternoon, is the historian can use uh, praxeology to help explain history, although the historian, uh, you can't deduce particular events from history, the historian can use praxeological laws to help explain history. And I'll, in my lecture this afternoon, I'll give examples of this. And Mises takes this to be part of a more general point that the historic praxeology is one of the sciences, and the historian can always use the results of the sciences in helping him explain actions. It's, he, and Mises thinks that uh, the result, the historian in trying to explain some phenomena always has to be in agreement with what the sciences have established. For example, supposing the historian is trying to explain the there was various times in European history there were mass persecution of witches, the European witch craze of the 16th century, a famous essay by Hugh Trevor Roper. So how would the historian explain that? Well, according to Mises, the historian wouldn't say, well, what happened was there were various women who were in communion with the devil, so they had to get rid of them because that wouldn't accord with modern scientific knowledge, so the historian wouldn't do that. Now, it's kind of a rather odd, uh, somewhat ironic, that one of the leading 20th century historians of witchcraft was the English eccentric Montague Summers, who did believe exactly that. And his books on witchcraft give that explanation. Of course, Mises could say he shouldn't have done that, but in fact, it isn't right that historians always do uh, use uh, explain things in accord with 
current scientific knowledge. Sometimes they don't, but according to Mises, they should. And uh, although the historian can use praxeology and results of the, of the sciences to help him explain particular events, that won't be enough. Uh, because in the sciences, we're, we're not, again, as I said before, we're not trying to explain particular events. Uh, we can't do this through praxeology. So what the historian has to do, he, according to me, is that very often he'll list various causal factors involved in a particular event. But beside, after he's done that, he has to estimate how the how influential these factors have been. And to do that, he has to use his own judgment. He can't apply general rules to estimate the influence of these causal factors. And Mises calls this process of judgment a specific understanding, or the German term for Stehen. It's a kind of uh, understanding of a particular e event. So what the historian in, in using specific understanding is doing is trying to explain how someone with particular values and beliefs would act, say, if a particular actor had certain beliefs about the world and certain value, values, certain ends he was trying to achieve, he would do such and such. So by imagining that, the historian is then able to explain particular events. Uh, it, you can, the same type of judgment where you have an intuitive understanding of the particular can be compared with entrepreneurs. The entrepreneur is trying to see, is there a profit, profit opportunity in a particular situation? And Mises used the term for stay in the same term for applied to the story and the specific understanding also for the entrepreneur. Again, it, the, the historian or the entrepreneur isn't using uh, fixed rules, but is trying to, is using his intuitive judgment. Uh, and in doing so, the historian uses what's called ideal types. This is a concept uh, Mises gets from Max Weber, the great German sociologist who was a friend of his. So what an ideal type is, is it's the representation, representation of complex phenomena of reality, your men, institutions of ideology. So what you do with an ideal type, even if it's an institution, you always make reference to human motivations and you say, someone with such and such motivations would act in a certain way. So you imagine somebody who has, say, well, say uh, the warrior is motivated by military glory, so you would impute certain values to him, and then by using that ideal type, you could exp use that to help you explain what particular people in history have done. Uh, so uh, in considering ideal types, we, they don't have exact definitions. They're just clusters of, of uh, characteristics that may or may not apply in particular instances. For example, suppose you have the ideal type of a revolution. It might be that the American Revolution doesn't meet all these characteristics, but if it meets enough of them, then you can use the ideal type. So that is the basic way uh, Mises tries to distinguish praxeology from history. So again, we have the contrast between praxeology, which is general laws of any action in history, which deals with particular events. So uh, I can't think of a good joke to end with unless you take the whole lecture to be well, extended joke. So I think we'll stop. Thank you.